Bill, it's just incredible. So many plants in one place, they all seem so healthy. There's hardly any insect or disease damage to be found. It's amazing they can keep up with it all. Well, one of their secrets is their outstanding integrated pest management program. To find out more, we spoke with Casey Sklar, the head of that program. Hi, I'm Casey Sklar, and I'm the Integrated Pest Management Coordinator for Longwood Gardens, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about integrated pest management. Well, what is integrated pest management? Well, simply put, it's a blend of different tactics used together to combat pest management problems. It's a blend of tools such as the use of a biological control, maybe buying or releasing a beneficial insect to control a pest insect, or the use of a cultural control, something like planting the right plant in the right spot or a plant that's more resistant to a pest. And what is a pest? Just about anything is a pest in the eyes of an integrated pest management philosophy. An example of a pest could be anything. It could be an insect or a mite. It could be a disease. It could be a weed. And the types of tactics that you use to achieve that goal can be just as varied. You could choose to use natural control by just letting the weather take its course and either get colder or hotter and eliminate the pest problem. You could use cultural controls such as host plant resistance. It can be a physical control such as a trap that you might use for a rodent in a barn. And even the use of pesticides or chemical controls can be used. Usually we try to focus on those that are less toxic, better for the environment, such as a horticultural oil or an insecticidal soap. Integrated pest management is really a lot of things. It's a toolbox approach to pest management whereby you pick the most effective tool without going directly to the most toxic one. And you really try not to kill every single pest that's out there. You set a level that you can tolerate and try to manage the population at that level. And you use it in a stair-step approach. You start off using the method of control that has the least impact and move your way up as circumstances dictate. Here at Longwood Gardens, we employ integrated pest management philosophies throughout our garden. It's open 365 days a year, and there's about 365 acres that the public walks through, including four acres of conservatory space. A way we might manage a, a mealybug problem in our conservatory would be to use a biological control, such as releasing a beneficial insect to control our mealybugs. Or perhaps a chemical control would be the use of insecticidal soap to try and reduce those mealybugs. Out in our landscape, with an example of something like hemlock woolly adelgid, we might use something like monitoring the soil moisture levels, the water levels in the plant over time, because hemlocks really need a lot of water. That'd be an example of a cultural control. Or perhaps if those adelgid population levels were so high, we'd have to come in and use a spray of horticultural oil, and that would be a chemical control strategy. But we'd time it with the pest life stages so that we made sure it was the most effective application possible. So you can see that even at Longwood, integrated pest management makes sense. And I think it makes even better sense when employed by a homeowner in their backyard. It is extremely important to be cautious when storing harmful chemicals in and around the home, especially with children and pets present. Harmful chemicals include things like herbicides and insecticides, but also can include things like ammonia and household bleach. Fortunately, there are some simple things you can do to promote safety when storing these chemicals around the home. Of course, it's best to store these chemicals in a locked enclosure. However, this is not often possible. If you need to leave these chemicals in open areas or on shelves, make sure to keep them up high so children could not easily get to them. Also, don't keep toys on the same shelf or in the same area. You don't want children reaching for their favorite toy and accidentally coming in contact with harmful pesticides. Never take pesticides out of their original container and place them in another type of container. Not only is it illegal according to state and federal laws, it is easy to forget what is in the container. And also, never store food items in the same area to avoid risk of contamination. Keep pesticides away from the common areas around the home that children use and never store them under the sink in the kitchen. Always store them in a locked enclosure such as a shed or an isolated area in the garage. Always have a broom, dustpan, kitty litter or sand around to help clean up liquids that might spill. Remember, always take precautions around the home when storing pesticides so you can protect yourself and your family. Did you know that there's some very effective grub controls that don't rely on traditional pesticides? And best of all, these natural alternatives target the grubs and leave the beneficial insects in the soil unharmed. 
but we'll show you some of these fascinating alternatives. But first, we'll discuss how to identify grub damage, then we'll show you how to use even traditional products more effectively. So how do we identify grub damage? Let's take a look at this particular lawn to give us some clues to help pinpoint the problem. Here we have some patches of yellow to brownish grass and even some bare spots spread throughout the lawn. In previous years, we've seen drought and heat stress, which can cause a general yellowing and browning of the grass. However, in this lawn, we've noticed damage areas expanding in a circular pattern, which is normally a sign of an insect or disease problem. Let's take a closer look. One key symptom of severe grub damage is that we can sometimes lift the turf like a rug. The turf lifts like a rug because the roots have been eaten by the grubs. In some cases, you may still be able to see the grubs feeding, as you see here. More commonly, however, we may need to dig a little to find them. Dig out a square foot patch of lawn and count the number of grubs feeding on grass roots. If you have over 10 to 12 grubs per square foot, you may need to control them. However, many properly maintained lawns can tolerate higher insect numbers. It's not that uncommon to have grubs in your lawn. But it's when there are too many that they cause visible injury. Let's take a look at the life cycle of grubs so that you can understand why the timing of controls is so important. A grub is actually a beetle larva. June beetles, Japanese beetles, and Oriental beetles are the most common in our area. In early spring, when the weather warms up, the adult grubs migrate near the surface. They feed for a month or more on grass roots and then turn into the pupal stage. The pupal stage transforms into an adult beetle, usually in July. Adult beetles feed on a great variety of plants. The beetles mate and lay eggs in the grassy areas. The eggs hatch around August. These recently hatched immature grubs in early to mid-August are the most susceptible to chemical and biological controls. Now that we know that grubs are causing the severe damage to this lawn, let's take a look at our options for control. Insecticides are commonly used and are very effective with proper application and timing. To maximize grub control, the soil should be moist before application. Then irrigate with one half inch of water to wash into the root zone. An exception to the guidelines I just mentioned is with the newer systemic insecticides. They should be applied earlier in the season to allow time for these products to take effect. Remember, before reaching for any pesticide, first properly identify the problem that you have and the level of damage. For more information on grub control, visit our website. There you can link to the Rutgers Diagnostic Lab and learn how to submit a sample to the lab for identification. You know concerns over pesticide use has prompted researchers to develop new methods of biological control for grubs. One such method is parasitic nematodes. These tiny worms can be very effective. These microscopic worms are a relatively recent addition to the arsenal of grub controls. They are a natural alternative to pesticides and provide a least toxic approach to grub control because they leave the beneficial soil inhabitants unharmed. You can order parasitic nematodes through mail order and they'll arrive in a mixture like sponges, gels, granules, or powder. Order them right before you plan to use them to help ensure that they are alive. Always follow the label directions carefully. For example, with sponges we place in water and squeeze out the nematodes. Then put the water with the parasitic nematodes into a spray container and spray over your lawn. It is very important to water them into your lawn to wash them down into the root zone. Make sure you apply them in the afternoon, evening, or on an overcast day. If you apply them in full sun, they will dry up and die before the grubs can get to them. So, Professor, before we leave, do you have any other advice for gardeners? Yes, it is important not to apply pesticides or any kind of grub control before you really know what kind of problem you're dealing with. For example, birds or animals foraging on your lawn might just be looking for earthworms, which are desirable to have. So make sure that you know what kind of grub you're dealing with and what kind of level of infestation you have. And as I mentioned earlier, for proper identification of grubs, you can send them to the Rutgers Diagnostic Lab or visit our website for more information on their ID and control. Mm -hmm.